Greetings. My name is Terry Covey and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you and have a great day. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Philippians. And we are going to be, other than maybe like Mother's Day and a few special things like that, we're going to be in the book of Philippians for quite some time. And actually we started Wednesday night. It's what I'm going to be preaching on Wednesday night and Sunday morning, both. And I, it's just, it's going to be a rich, rich thing, I think, for us just to get ourselves absorbed in God's Word. And then also, in addition, I'm going to start doing something a little different with my blog, or the, if you pick up one of the copies of the devotional, actually what you'll study this upcoming week will be with it as well. So you've got a Sunday morning message, you've got a Wednesday night, and then you've got a daily reading that you can go with as well. And you say, well, why so much just in the book of Philippians? Well, because it's just such a rich book. It really is, and it's very practical book, and it's, it covers a lot of different topics, and it's easy for us to understand, but it's, it's a precious book, and it's a church. The Philippians, they were a body of believers. The Apostle Paul helped to establish. He, along with Silas and, and Timothy, they were led by the Spirit to go to Philippi, to this region, and to establish this church. And as we start out today, the first section that we're going to cover today is Paul's prayer for the Philippians. And as you can see, the title of the message is Christians Who Seem to Flourish. There are some people who seem to flourish as a Christian, as a believer. And by that, I don't mean necessarily that they prosper monetarily, but that they, through life, they seem to enjoy life more. They seem to enjoy their Christianity more. They seem to be more plugged in and fruitful and just living out the Christian life. I know you've met people like that, and hopefully you are someone like that. There are some people who really seem to flourish in their Christianity and there are some people who seem to flounder in their Christianity. So what, what's the difference? Why is it that some people flourish while other people seem to flounder? Well, hopefully today will give us some of the insight of why that is. Paul is going to be praying for these Philippians. And look at verse 9. First of all, he's telling us what his prayer is for them. And this I pray, that your love, and the love that he's talking about there is a Christian kind of love, that your love as a Christian, Christ-like love, may abound yet more and more. They, they were already a church that loved. They were a loving group of people. But Paul said, I want your love, I pr I'm praying that your love as a believer will flourish. Why is that so important? Well, the Bible tells us that God is love, for one thing. The Bible says that anyone who doesn't love as God loves doesn't know God. The Bible says anyone who doesn't love his brother really is not a believer. Paul said to the Corinthians that though I could speak with the tongues of men and angels, though I would have faith to move mountains, though I would understand all mysteries and knowledge, he says, if I don't have love in my heart, he says, it's nothing. It's useless. God is not into formal, ritual kind of Christianity. He's not into just doing what you have to do. He's not into us just coming to church because it's the thing to do. The Bible says that God loves us. That's what motivated Jesus to go to the cross. God so loved the world that he was willing to give his son. And the Bible then says, therefore, because God is love and because such is, love is such a great thing that we should be people of love. Matter of fact, Jesus said, here's how people will actually know that you are my followers. How? By the fact that you have a steeple. No. What? You love that you have love, that there's love is evident in a church. So Paul says, I am praying that your love will abound yet more and more. It will overflow, is what he's saying, in knowledge and all judgment, so that, verse 10, you may learn to approve things that are excellent, so that you may be sincere or genuine in your faith without any kind of offense before God until the day of Christ, until Christ returns. So that... You will be filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So let's kind of break that prayer down some and 
see if we can understand what it is that Paul is praying for and how we can apply it to our lives. First of all, I want to call your attention to the fact that Paul was thanking God for the Philippians. Look back up at verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, or Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ. To all, notice he's going to include the entire church. To all the saints, that means all the members. Who's a saint? Well, some people believe a saint is someone that they designate, bestow sainthood upon. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that anyone who's truly a born-again believer is a saint in Christ. And the word, you know, Vernon McGee used to say, if people looked at our lives, they would say, saint, you ain't. You know, we, we sometimes don't live as a saint, but the word saint actually means to be set apart unto God. Sanctuary is a similar word. What is a sanctuary? A sanctuary means a place that is set apart to God. Sanctification is the process of God setting you apart. The Bible says that God saved us. We've already wrote to Titus. The Bible says that God saved us because he wanted to set us apart unto himself, a peculiar people who would be zealous of good works. Jesus told one church, he says, you make me sick because you're lukewarm. A lukewarm church is sickening to Christ. Some churches wonder why they're dying, and some churches try all kinds of things to keep themselves from dying. And I have churches talk with me from time to time, and, and our church is this. And, and part of the reason, not always, but sometimes the reason is because it's lukewarm. It's just kind of going through the motions. And not only do people don't not attend, the Lord, I don't think, even really attends a church like that. So he says, I'm writing to all the saints, those that are set apart, verse 1, in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, along with the bishops, a bishop's another word for a pastor or spiritual leader, and the deacons, the men who have been called to be supportive in the ministry. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, notice what he says. Now, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. When Paul is writing this, he's hundreds of miles away from Philippi. He's actually in prison. He was arrested for the gospel. He was arrested for preaching the gospel and for living for the gospel. He was arrested for believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's been transported to Rome and he's in prison and he'll have to eventually stand before Caesar and give an account. And Paul, while he's there, he's a man of prayer. And he says, every time I think about you, way back hundreds of miles away in Philippi, every time I think think of you. Every time you cross my mind, Paul says, one of the first things that I do is I just thank God for you. Perhaps there were some people Paul couldn't thank God for. You know, you can't necessarily be thankful for everybody, can you? But Paul said, every time I think about you, I, I just have to thank you, God, for bringing them into my life. And then he says in verse 4, always in every prayer of mine, every time I pray, I have to mention you of mine for you all making requests with joy. He says, when I pray for you, I just I feel a joy, I feel a peace because of who you are and how God has used you in verse 5. And he says, here's one of the reasons I thank God for you, for your fellowship in the gospel from the very first day. That is the very first day I presented the gospel to you there in Philippi until this very day. Paul was in prison. He had been there for two or three years. I once read, if they were arresting people for being a Christian, would they find enough evidence to convict you? Paul was arrested for being a Christian. There was evidence, indeed, that he was a believer. And he was there in prison. And you know the prison wouldn't be a pleasant place to be. But the Bible says that while Paul was there in prison, you know, Satan oftentimes attacks God's children, and he attacks them in a, very, a variety of kind of ways. And Satan thinks that when he attacks God's children that he's weakened them and that he's put them out of commission. And the truth of the matter is, there, a Christian is really n never more powerful than when they've been afflicted in some way and they go to God in prayer. Affliction has a way of making us pray. If everything just went rosy for us all the time, we probably wouldn't pray too much. But when a trouble, when a difficulty, whether it's physical, financial, a family problem, whatever it might be, when that problem comes into our life, it causes us to pray. And the Bible says, really, there's no time that we're more powerful than when we're praying. 
And honestly, the, more, the greater the affliction, the more we pray. If things are kind of going good, and, and I do this, and I know you do it as well, if things are going good, we kind of squeeze in a prayer while we're multitasking and doing everything else. You know, I'll kind of pray while I'm cooking or driving down the road. And that, you ought to pray without ceasing. But if a difficulty comes in your life, isn't it amazing how that you have time to get down on your knees, maybe on your face, and pray to God? And that's why God allows difficulties in our life. That's why I, 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 probably we don't go into a physical prison, but there's confinement, there's difficulty in our life. And the reason God allows that is to push us to pray, to cause us to pray. And it was while Paul was in prison that he wrote some of his, really some of his greatest letters. He wrote the letter to the Philippians. He wrote the letter to the Ephesians. He wrote the letter to the Colossians. He wrote the letter to Philemon. So it was that while he was in prison that Paul was praying and writing these letters and every, one, every letter he was saying, I just pray for you always. But Paul also during this time, notice what he says again, verse 3, he says, when I'm here in prison, when I'm here all alone, he says, and I think about you, I have to thank God for you every time I think about you. Why was Paul so thankful for them? Well, he was thankful, number one, because God was using them. He says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the very first day until now. What does the word fellowship mean? Some people think that the word fellowship means that we'll just get together and have a cup of coffee. And that's kind of a fellowship, but that's not really the fellowship that the Bible is talking about. The word fellowship as it's used in the Bible refers to a joint participation. It means, I had a pastor years ago that said fellowship is two fellows in the same ship. It's two people in the same boat that are working together, that are praying together. The Bible says that we have fellowship with God and we have fellowship with each other as believers in Christ. And our fellowship is more than just a social gathering or a potluck meal. It means that we're on the same team, that we're doing the same thing. And Paul was thankful for the fellowship of the Philippians. The Bible says that they often sent physical support to him. They sent money to help him out. They invested in the ministry of Paul. Paul also was close friends with many of them. You will remember if you were here Wednesday night as we went through our study, Paul was the one who actually established this church. He led the very first person that was a member of that church, a woman by the name of Lydia. Paul was the one who led her to the Lord. Paul was the one who established the youth group. He came across a demon-possessed girl and drove a demon out of her, a teenager, and established the youth group with that. Paul then led, he changed a man's life. He was a Philippian jailer. This man had been just such a rough, harsh kind of man. And you can imagine what a man would be like, an unsaved man that was a jailer back in the days of the first century. How rough a man would have had to have been in order to try to handle the prisoners but the Bible says this same man, before he was saved, he beat Paul. He whipped him with many stripes. But after he was saved, the Bible says this same man took Paul to his house and he fed him from his own table and washed his stripes, washed his wounds. So Paul was friends with all of these people. And Paul, he had physical fellowship with them, but he also had spiritual fellowship with them. Verse 7 says, as it is meet or as it is right for me to think this way of you all. He says, because number one, because I have you in my heart. I love you is what Paul's saying to them. And not only do I have you in my heart, but I have you now in my bonds. Even though they were hundreds of miles away, they were just like, it was just like they were there with Paul. How is that? Because Paul knew that they loved him. Paul knew that they were praying for him. And he says, you're with me. I have fellowship with you. When I think about you, I have fellowship because you're here with me in my spirit, in my bonds, and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. You are partakers. You have fellowship with me of my grace. So let me sum that up, what Paul is saying. Paul's actually saying this. You have no idea how much I love you and how much God is using you to help strengthen me. Now, I can see the look on your face. A lot of you are drifting. So pull back into the parking lot here a minute. Let me ask you a question. If suddenly you found yourself flat on your back in a hospital room, 
of a terminal illness. How important would it be for you to be closely associated with a church family? On a scale of 1 to 10, Roger, how important is it when you're in your house for three or four months and can't get out? How important is a church fellowship? It's a 13. I said 1 to 10. He said, here's a man that's just gone through it. He said, it's a 13. Were you thankful for this church? Were you thankful for this church? Yes. Were you thankful for the prayers? Were you thankful for a card? Were you thankful for a visit? Does it make a big... See, right here is evidence. If, if I may put it this way, and I let, uh, probably one of the hardest men, you know, in our church. I, you know, it takes ten people to work as hard as, as Roger and Jerry Nestor. To be honest with you. So one of the hardest men, in many ways, when God touched his body, the thing he valued the most was the fellowship prayers. That's what Paul's talking about here. That's why Paul says, every time I, th I think about you, I, I thank God. I thank God that I know you. I thank God that you're praying for me. I thank God that you're, you're with me in this and by your love for me, you're giving me the strength that I need. And we have prayed for Roger and, and for the last three Sundays, Roger's been able to be with us. Praise God for that. And we've missed Roger. We have missed him as well. Matter of fact, Pat and Lorraine, they're, they're not here today, but Lorraine didn't even know Roger's name, but she came and she said, that gentleman that always sits right there, I noticed that he hasn't been in church. You know, This is what Paul is talking about in this, in this letter. And Paul says, I'm thankful that God has used you in my life. And he says, I'm also thankful that I know that God will continue to use you. Look at verse 6, what he says. Being confident of this very thing, that he that is God, which hath begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question here. Do any of you, your Christian life, would, would the word roller coaster somehow to describe your Christian life? Anybody, do you understand what I'm saying when I say roller coaster Christianity? We're all, I have had that a lot, especially in my life. Uh, soon be saved for 45 years. Been a roller coaster ride many times. You know who's been faithful through it all? God. Jesus Christ. The Bible says, I didn't choose God, God chose me. Why He chose me, I don't know. But I thank God, I, I would assume probably almost every day, I thank God. Almost every day, at least several times a week, I will thank God, obviously, for my salvation. And I thank God for the opportunity to serve Him. And I thank God that He brought me here to Twin Oaks. I continuously thank God for that. And it, it hasn't been me, but it's been God. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I'm thankful. I know that it was God who's the one who began this work in you. It was God who's the one who called you to this salvation. And it is God who will continue to Perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know what your security as a Christian is based upon? It is not based upon you. It's based upon God. The reason many of us, and I'm one of them, the reason we believe, talk about eternal security is because, you know, like I heard Steve Brown on the radio say many years ago, that he said the truth of the matter is, he said, if you could lose your salvation, you, you already would have lost it. I'd lose my salvation four or five times a day, wouldn't you? Especially when somebody gets on my bumper and I'm trying to drive down the road. Yeah. But God keeps calling me back. God keeps working in my life. God is the one that puts you know, in your heart. God's the one who calls you to church. God's the one who saved you. God's the one who brought you here. God is the one who wants to work in your life and use you for His glory. And Paul says, I thank God because God saved you and God is using you and I thank God that God will continue to use you until Jesus returns. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. We'll get to this passage and we'll preach on it here more at a later time. But let's notice what Paul 
said. He said, wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He didn't say work for your salvation. He said work out. What does it mean, work out? He says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will, that is, to have the desire, and to do of his good pleasure. God's the one who saved you. God's the one who brings you to church. God's the one that moves upon your heart and says, you know, you need to get involved and volunteer and help work in the nursery. You're the, you need to get involved and help work in Awana. You need to get involved and help work in Wonderful Wednesdays or in Bible school or Sportsman Bank with parking cars or cooking or, yes, you can do this. You need to get involved. The Bible says it's God who is doing this in you. And Paul says, I thank God that he is doing this, that he will continue to do this that he started this work, and that he'll continue to do this work until Jesus returns. Now, all of that really is a way of kind of an introduction. Paul says, I'm praising you, I'm thanking God that he's doing all this, and then he says, not only am I praising you, but he says, I'm praying for you. Again, verse 9. And he says, with this, this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more. I think what Paul is saying to the Philippians, and I think he could say the same thing. In my heart, I believe he could say the same thing to Twin Oaks Baptist Church. I believe if Paul was living, I believe he could write some of this to this church as well. I believe Paul would say, I am thankful for how God has used you. And I'm thankful to know that God wants to continue to use you. And what I'm praying is, is that you will flourish as a body of Christ not just in numbers, but in Christ-like love, in genuine Christianity. I, I am thankful for this church. I am thankful for all that goes on in this church and all the, the various ministries that we have, and I'm thankful for everyone who works. I'm thankful for, you know, for the singing, for the music. I'm thankful for the clean building and all of and that it's paid for and I'm thankful for all of that. And I, you know, and I had a pastor to tell me one time. Actually, it's, it's Josh, who's my son-in-law's dad, who's a pastor. He said, you know, he said, Terry, he said, the truth of the matter is, he said, do you know how many pastors in America would love just to be in your position? And I said, yeah, I've got it pretty good. I am thankful for that. And so, I'm thankful. But as your pastor, I would say this. I believe this church is maybe doing, actually doing 30% of what it could do. I believe that there is so much talent, and I'm not trying to pat us, I'm saying to much given what much is required. I'm believing that, th I believe that this church, and the name, and the reputation, and all that God has, has brought together, all of the variety of people that He's brought together with different, personalities and different gifts and abilities and all the people that God has brought together, I believe that if we, beginning with me, if we would focus on serving the one we call Lord and give, and, and, and I'm not saying this is all you can do as church, but not give to God what's left over of our time and our talent, and our treasures, but to actually make Him Lord and first of our life. Only God knows what could be accomplished through this church. Only God knows. I mean, I'm, I'm, thankful, for, I'm thankful for the music. I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to play and be a part of the music. But you know, I think about that, and I think about we had the opportunity two or three years to go to... Franklin Heights at the Women's uh, Spring Conference. Thank you. My mind went blank there. And we, we had the opportunity to do the music, and we had people that come up and say, is the music like that every week in your church? What? <laughs> I mean, I've got to be honest. Uh, yeah. Some weeks better than others. Some weeks we're going in every direction. What key is it? You know? 
I, I think in, in Bible studies. I think in, I think in, if, and let me just sum this up. In all the churches that I've been a, a member of in my life, in ministry, if I have ever been a part of a church that had the opportunity to actually put a smile on God's face, I believe it is this church. I really, really, and I thank God for all that He does, but I'm like Paul, you know, I'm not content. And to be honest with you, if I retire when I'm about 80, I won't be content then. Is it? I'll still be. Come on. Let's go for it. I want it myself. I'm not content with me. I'm always looking for my, myself. How can I even more? How can God? Matter of fact, Pastor Zach and I, well, I've had prayer myself this morning. Tammy and I had prayer, and Pastor Zach and I had prayer, and brother, am I not right? The thing I prayed for, Lord, help me just to love people today. Not just go through the motions but truly, genuinely love people. Paul says, I pray that your love will abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. What does he mean by that? The word knowledge means a perfect and complete understanding. You see, here's, here's what the problem is for many Christians. We love, but we just kind of love the wrong things. Sometimes we love ourselves. Sometimes our love for ourselves is ahead of God. Sometimes our love for our job is ahead of our love for God. Sometimes our love for some activity or recreation or whatever it might be is ahead of God. I was recently, I was with a brother in Christ and we were just starting to talk and he said something and I thought, wow, what he said. He told me as we were talking there, he said, you know, he says, I'm learning the more I read God's word. He said, I'm learning that Jesus Christ is supposed to be number one in my life. And he said, and here was his illustration, he said, he had a red shirt. He said, if this red shirt becomes more important than Jesus Christ, I need to get rid of this red shirt. And I thought, you got it. You understand what it is that Jesus has saved you for. And I need to pray for you that you'll live it out. You understand what it is to call Jesus Lord. Master. Head of everything. And Paul says, I don't want you to go through life just like you're in a daze. Some Christians, bless their heart, they go through life like they're just in a fog. They're just kind of just drifting and floating and bouncing off the circumstances and up and down and just whatever and hot and cold. And Paul says, I want you to get into the Word and I want you to understand what the truth is and what's real so that you can focus your attention on this and being obedient to this. Because one day we'll stand before the Lord, won't we? And we'll give an account for what we did with this. You know, can I be so bold to say, I believe if there's a church here that's able to hear the Word of God, it's this church. It's hard for you to come into this building and not hear somebody give you a Bible lesson, isn't it? Take your Bible and turn to such and such and study. And Paul's saying, I'm praying that your love, this, this love that caused God to send His Son to this world, this love will overflow in you. But it won't be that you'll just love, love, love. All you need is love. Just go through this world, you know, like the Unitarian Church or something like that. We should just love everybody and just... That's not what Paul's talking about. What Paul is talking about, he says, a love that is based upon the knowledge, that is based upon the truth. He says, so that, verse 10 so that you may approve things that are excellent, so that you'll have godly discernment and understand what the truth is and that you'll make wise choices in life. Ninety-nine percent of the problems we have in life, and maybe that's a high figure, they're self-imposed because we make foolish decisions. Because we do not make decisions based upon the eternal truth of God, but we make a decision based upon whatever, whatever somebody thinks, whatever is popular. And Paul says, I want you to have the ability, as you study God's Word, he says he was so proud of the Philippians, he said, I want you just to flourish as a church, to just explode with God's power working in you. But he says, what I want is this, what, this flourishing is based upon the truth of God, that you're loving what God loves. And as you go through life, you know, we sometimes say that we have to make a decision between good and bad. 
As we start out as a baby Christian, listen, as we start out as a baby Christian, we have to make a decision between good and bad. But as we mature as a Christian, we have to learn how to make a decision between good and best. Paul said this to the Corinthians. He said, all things are lawful to, for me, but not all things are beneficial. You know, I know some Christians that they think, well, who says I can't do that? Who says I can't wear that? Who says I can't do this with my body? Who says I can't go? I'm saved by grace. I can do whatever I want to. You know what the truth is? You're saved by grace. But you're wasting your Christian life. You're wasting your Christian life by your foolish decisions, what you choose in life. Paul says, I want you to have this wisdom that is from God, this godly discernment, so that you'll understand what is good and what is best, so that you'll choose the superior things, so that you can be filled with the very fruitfulness of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus. Look at verse 9 again. This I pray that your love, may abound, may flourish more and more in knowledge, that is wisdom and discernment, so that you will examine and approve the superior things, so that as you walk through this world, you will be sincere without offense until the day of Christ Jesus, so that by doing so, you will be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus, until the glory and praise of God. You know, when you and I do something to serve God, when you and I yield our life to serve God and be obedient to God, when we truly do something for no other reason than the fact that we love the Lord, the Bible says there's at least a fourfold blessing out of that. How so? Well, the Philippians blessed Paul, number one, by meeting his needs, right? By sending him food and clothing and whatever it might be. So there's part of the reward. Paul was rewarded. He was blessed by the fact that he received what it was that he needed. But what about the Philippians? They were blessed by doing it. They were blessed. Jesus said this, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. You know, for a long time, I didn't know, I struggled with that verse. I thought, oh yeah, just give me the gift. What, what's that mean when Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive? The way that that is is when you really love someone, you really care about someone, and God can use you to help meet that need. It brings a joy to you, doesn't it? It brings a joy. I don't know if you've ever, ever experienced that. If not, if you haven't, I pray that you will. I pray that you will experience what it is to just meet a need in somebody's life to be used by God to do that. The Bible says they were blessed as they were giving themselves. I'm sure that they loved Paul and as they gathered together these things and would reach out to Paul and send these care packages, they were blessed. But you know who else is blessed? The Bible says Jesus Christ is blessed. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. It says in the book of Revelation in regards to the crowns that some may receive, when we get to heaven, if you've served Christ faithfully and you receive a crown for doing that, when you get to heaven, what does the Bible say that you'll do with that crown? Word it around and show off in heaven what it is that you've got? What will you do with it? Why will you cast it before Jesus? Why is it His? Why? He's the only one that's actually worthy of it. He's the one that's only... And so actually, when you and I... When you and I do something, listen. If somebody, let's say that, uh, let's say that there's somebody that's in financial need. Let's say there's somebody that's in financial need, and God moves upon your heart to send them some money to help meet that need, and they're a Christian. And when they open up that letter and they take out that money. Brittany, what are they probably going to do? When they open up and they see that money, and then they, what, are, what are they going to? They're going to be overwhelmed. And, and what's probably going to come out of their mouth, Terry? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I'm sure you're someone that understands what on this right here. 
okay? And what you had to go through. And then when people would try to reach out, and it put such a smile in my heart when I would hear you say, my church family has taken such good care of me. And I'm like, yes. Yes. Don't you know that's what Jesus is saying? Yes. Yes. You're doing it. Do you know who else is blessed? The Bible says it's unto the praise and glory and praise of God the Father. You know what the Bible says is going to happen in the very end? Let me read something to you out of the book of Corinthians. When Jesus has conquered all things, the Son then will present himself to God the Father so that God the Father who gave his Son authority over things will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. You know, we're going to take our our crowns or our rewards in heaven and we're going to cast them back before Jesus and to thank Jesus for this but you know what Jesus is going to do with it at the very end after the tribulation period and everything you know what Jesus is going to do with it he's going to turn around and lay it before the Father and everything is going to be under remember I taught a few weeks ago about that umbrella of protection everything then under the umbrella the angels the Old Testament saints the church everything under the umbrella of God's love and care. 